probably isn't um, doing anything more than stating the obvious that uh, when requests were made by Steve and Josh for people for subjects for this talk, um, the Jamie and James got back to Josh uh, sooner than I did. So I end up with the um, somewhat more obscure subjects. But I did think that proprietary estoppel in particular was something which um, was very pertinent to uh, the broad subject that we've got here of uh, probate and the running of probate, uh, particularly a certain type of proprietary stop. And I will come to some of the uh, detailed components of it shortly, but I did want to make clear what it is precisely that I'm looking at today. Um, and that's why I've divided the types of proprietary estoppel into three there. Um, we have the classics of representation based estoppel. So for example, if somebody says to you, that's your land, you could do what you like on it, you build on it. And then you said, oh, well, actually it was my land all along. That could give rise to a representation based proprietary estoppel and prevent the representor going back on that. Um, we also have an acquiescence based um, estoppel as well, uh, whereby simply by not doing anything and giving the impression uh, that uh, uh, in that example that I just gave that the, the land in fact belonged to the person building on it, uh, that might give rise to an estoppel too. What I'm talking about, I'd say, because this is what will come up, I think, nearly always, if it's going to come up in, in a private claim, it will nearly always be what's called a, a promise-based, which the textbooks will call it a promise-based proprietary estoppel. And a promise-based proprietary estoppel is a pretty unusual uh, legal animal, if one thinks about it in any detail, because um, it involves a, uh, a a promise made which is not going to be fulfilled at that point. It's going to be fulfilled at some subsequent uh, point, uh, usually on the death of the promisor, and that there are circumstances in which a court will not permit a promisor to go back on that promise, or at least not without some consequence. So what I've done here is, um, again, at the risk of testing patients when we come to de the, the individual components in a moment, is to try and give a, an example uh, of, of what we're talking about. Because as somebody who is used to dealing with uh, the um, a, a wills-based approach, which obviously most all probate practitioners will be, uh, will find proprietary estoppel, I think, understandably, a little counterintuitive or uh, a, a, little, a little odd. Um, there is no requirement um, for uh, the formalities of a will. Uh, there's no re requirement even for it to be in writing uh, what, is, what is done. Um, and if the donor uh, thinks again, so if, if the donor says, well, when I die, this will, this will be yours, um, and thinks again during the course of his lifetime, that doesn't necessarily get him off the hook. So it's not, uh, it's not like a, a will which is revocable um, at any point. Um, it isn't uh, either uh, akin to a doctrine of mutual will so it doesn't have to be something which is stated to be irrevocable it can still be uh, it, it can still be action that's um a case called taylor and dickens which was actually appealed uh, and then compromised on appeal but at the first in first instance in that case um the judge said well i'm not making a finding of proprietary stopper because it wasn't um, it wasn't stated to be an irrevocable promise that was made. That was officially disapproved of in uh, Gillett and Holt. It says that is not something uh, which is necessary, uh, or to use the words of uh, Lord Justice Walker, which you see there at item two, inherent revocability of testamentary dispositions is irrelevant to a promise or assurance that uh, all this uh, will be yours. Um, and the promise can't even be made by, by saying, I will leave it to you in my will. Um, there is 
a uh, further point there, point four, which I've put down uh, there. This is really, I think, to sort of highlight the distinction between constructive trust and proprietary estoppel. Constructive trust, I'm not going to deal with today. today. I, I know that that is going to be more familiar to most practitioners probably than proprietary estoppel. I think the biggest distinction to be drawn between proprietary estoppel and constructive trust is that in the case of a constructive trust, you're generally looking for some common intention between the parties. That is not uh, necessary in the case of uh, proprietary estoppel. There need only be sufficient link between the promises relied on and the conduct which constitutes the detriment. Now, I might come back to that in a little bit more detail, but the the promise saw and the promise see do not actually have to be entirely ad idem uh, for a proprietary estoppel to arise. Probably may help if I give a, a, a give Gillett and Holt's facts in outline as being a, an example of what we're talking about here. Um, the Mr. Gillett met Mr. Holt when Mr. Gillett was, was pretty young. He was only 12 years old. He started working for him from the age of about 15 on his farm. He made a number of sacrifices uh, during the course of his uh, during the course of his life uh, for Mr. Holt, to, to an, to, which enabled detriment to be found. He didn't go off to agricultural college so he could work for him. Uh, he worked for, for for low wages for, for quite a long period of time, and he received a lot of assurances during the course of his life. At one stage, Mr. Holt wanted to adopt him. Uh, at another stage, twice in fact, he tried to get Mr. Holt onto the uh, farm tenancy as a, as, as a joint tenant, it was a long-term tenancy, and the uh, freeholder declined to do that. At the christening of Mr. Uh, Gillett's first child, uh, Mr. Holt said that the the farm would pass on to another generation. He'd been given assurances before he got married and all these kind of things. And then everything turned uh, when um, Mr. Gillett uh, became supplanted uh, by a, a solicitor, in fact, who uh, worked for the firm that Mr. Holt was using. And the relationship between the Gillets and Mr. Holt uh, soured and they soured to the extent that not only did Mr. Holt take him out of his will, he um, even instigated uh, police action against uh, the Gillets, Mr. and Mrs. Gillett, uh, for alleged uh, malfeasance in respect of uh, managing accounts of the farm business. And they were subject to disciplinary action uh, in an employment context and dismissed. There was no, there was no, there was no police prosecution, but the relationship soured. Uh, hugely. And by 1994, uh, Mr. Wood had become the principal beneficiary in the will. Mr. Holt was still alive at this point. And um, because he, Mr. Gillett realised that he'd been put out of the, what he'd been uh, promised over the years, he, he instigated action at that point. So he didn't actually even wait until Mr. Holt had, uh, had, had passed on. And um, in a bit of a hotchpotch, the, the court ultimately awarded him the freehold of the property that uh, he and his wife were, li were living in, the, the farmhouse that they were living in, and compensation for being put out of the farm business that they would otherwise have um, uh, enjoyed. So I said that is an example of proprietary estoppel in action. I, I won't go in uh, to uh, some cases a bit more peripheral, uh, but uh, Anagra and Anagra is there as a, as a recent ex, as a recent example. That's a case where some where the where the promisor had died very briefly. He was a Nigerian chieftain with three wives. Alice was the third of his three wives. He bought a house in I think about 1976. She moved into it in 1984, and she received numerous promises from him that he that she could live there for the rest of her life. He died in about 2007, and then she lived there uh, thereafter. And indeed, uh, the second and third defendants, who was one of the sons, other sons of uh, the deceased, and his wife uh, moved into the property. She spent money on the property, she spent about £5,000 for placing the boiler. And she also spent money that was gifted to her by the second and third defendants, a sizable sum, £50,000, on uh, renovating the property. Probate was not taken out, sorry, 
administration was not taken out until uh, 10 years after his death, about 2017, at which point the, um, uh, one of the other sons who was the uh, administrator uh, it tried to put her out of the property and the court found that um, there was no difficulty in establishing proprietary estoppel in that case. Um, the uh, administrator said, well, she's been living in there rent free for a long period of time. Is that is that not enough? And the court felt that it wasn't. She was granted a uh, life uh, interest in uh, the, the property to give effect to the promises made. Well, I think it's just to bear in mind in relation to that case, because it will come back to this, is the the deceased died believing that his promise would be honoured. So he didn't actually do anything wrong. And there isn't a point to bear in mind, there isn't actually any need to prove that the promisor has acted poorly or unconscionably. It is a question of what the overall, the effect of the overall circumstances uh, are. Um, the countervailing benefits in that case, which I've quoted, uh, which were her rent-free occupation, were not sufficient to satisfy the equity, uh, as the wording uh, goes. Uh, another brief example I'll refer to uh, more briefly, I promised to refer to an agro briefly and didn't, but I will on this one, uh, Lothian and Dixon, which is a, a more local case uh, decided, uh, I think, in the Leeds District Registry, certainly in Yorkshire uh, somewhere, to give an example, again, of how proprietary estoppel can, can work uh, to uh, cousins who had been in the uh, deceased's uh, will, um, Mrs. MacArthur, uh, since 1983, she'd left uh, really everything to them in, in equal shares. She later became ill. She received a terminal diagnosis in about 2009 and asked uh, the uh, claimant to come in to live with her at the hotel that she ran to look after her and run the hotel, which she did for about nine months out of every 12 for a period of two or three years until Mrs. MacArthur died. Mrs. MacArthur had actually, late in life, had tried to uh, redo her will. She'd forgotten about her early will and tried to do her will, leaving everything to the claimant, but she'd never got it executed properly uh, before she died, but she had promised the hotel uh, to uh, the claimant, and that was um, upheld uh, by Roger Kay. He awarded her the entire estate, less some specific legacies, which were in the uh, valid earlier will. So I say there are a couple of examples of proprietary estoppel in action, uh, which brings me a little belatedly to the principles, which is what one has to prove uh, if one is going to set up a proprietary estoppel. One needs an assurance of sufficient clarity or a promise of sufficient clarity, so it has to be clear enough. Um, and uh, we'll come to that in a second. The has to be reliance by the claimant upon that insurance, assurance, in fact. And then thereafter, he has to act to his detriment in consequence of the reasonable reliance that he has placed. And then finally, the court needs to be satisfied that the circumstances are such that it would be unconscionable for the promise not to be kept in whole or in part. And that in whole or in part is important because it gives the court a very broad discretion as to the awards that they make, wider than in the case of, for example, a constructive trust. Um, there's also, uh, um, I, I've put in there because it, it appears in just about every case, it's although those four components are, are nearly always trotted out, in fact, extended to eight uh, by Lord Justice Lewis in, in Davies and Davies, which again, if people, it's quite a useful uh, way of uh, seeing how the courts approach it, is to look at paragraph 38 of Davies and Davies. I say it expands a little, expands those four points into eight. But um, the point made by Lord Justice Walker in Gillett and Holt is that they aren't three or four watertight compartments. So they, they, they all weigh in the balance, and they all overlap. And if you've got high levels of unconscionability, for example, you may need, may, may need to show less reliance, for example. Um, dealing with assurance of sufficient clarity first, the most important point to realize about this is that it doesn't actually matter what the intentions of the promisor were when he made his promise or gave his assurance. 
um, he may not have actually intended for the promisee to rely upon it. Um, so to put, use the words of Lord Hoffman, the question was whether his words and acts would reasonably have conveyed to the promisee an assurance that he would do what he said he would do. And that comes from a case called Thorner and Major, which I won't um, I keep promising this, I won't give detailed facts in relation to it. The point in relation to Thorner and Major was a farming case, as a lot of these cases are, and the uh, promisee in, in, in that case was, there was a family relationship that his father and, and the and the farm owner were, were cousins and he so there was a family relationship there he worked a long time uh, on the farm but they were very taciturn they were found to be very taciturn men the assurances that uh, mr thorner got in that case were were pretty minimal um back about uh, 15 20 years before the uh mr thorner Th senior died uh he'd handed a some bonus from an insurance uh, policy to him and said that's for my death duties and there wasn't an enormous amount else uh, for by way of assurance for the court to go on uh, in that case there had been a will which uh, Mr Thorner had executed in which he was the substantial beneficiary uh, but he destroyed that will not because of any falling out with Mr. Thorner Jr., but because uh, one of the he'd fallen out with one of the pecuniary legatees, and then he never got round to redoing his will. But the court in that case said, "Look, you've got to look at it from the point of view of uh, the people involved." And in this case, um, because they were such as had turned and knew and knew each other, didn't have uh, a, a lot of words. It was reasonable for Mr. Thorner Jr. to uh, take the words that were that were given to him as meaning that he was intended to inherit um, the farm. The property itself must be identified with sufficient clarity. Now in Thorner, when the case came to the House of Lords, the defendant ran another, which was the estate, ran another argument, they ran a new argument. And they said, well, this, this gentleman kept buying and selling bits of land, so that it wasn't identified with sufficient certainty when this promise was made as to what it related to. And Lord Rogers, uh, that the quote we see there um, said, said, yes, it is important that the property, it's a proprietary estoppel, so it's important that the property is identified, but it can, it can vary, it can move throughout the life of the, of the promise that was made. And so when he said you could have the farm, they both uh, promised and promised or took that as meaning it was the farm in whatever form it was at the time um, that, that, that Mr. Thorner Sr. died. Um, I have just put in one case there, later than Martin, as being an example of a case that falls on the other side of the uh, of the equation. That was a case where um, the, the deceased had been married to a lady who was uh, uh, incapacitated. He he took um, the claimant, in fact, as uh, the mistress. It was the words used in the in, in, in the case, um, and they. He said, I will give you such financial security during, during financial security during my life and financial security after my death. And that was the extent of, uh, of, of the assurance that he'd given her. They stayed together for a while, but that by the time he died, they had been split up for a, a period of time. Um, and uh, the court said that that was not an assurance of sufficient clarity. The property itself was not uh, identified. Uh, and so she failed in that case. Uh, moving on to uh, reliance, a uh, bit of a debate uh, within various cases as to whether there is a presumption of reliance uh, if you have got assurance and detriment. I think the bottom line in relation to this is it, it must be pleaded and proved and you do not, uh, you do not have a presumption. Um, there is a case which is probably, well, strictly speaking, is not a, uh, a case of uh, a promise-based uh, proprietary estoppel, but none the case, nonetheless, uh, a case of uh, certainly the case of estoppel. I think also proprietary estoppel uh, called Steria and Hutchinson, in which in which Lord Justice uh, Neuberger uh, says that there is no such presumption, which is effectively dis there's a there's an early, much earlier authority of Lord Dennings going back to a case called Greasley and Cook from 1980, which suggests that there is such a presumption. Um, and then there is one other case called Whaling and Jones, which suggests possibly that. But I think 
if one is going to run a case, I think one has to assume that there is no such presumption and prove it. If the promisee would have acted in the same way, come what may, then generally under the law of estoppel, so if they were carried on the same way, even if the promise had not been made, that would defeat a proprietary estoppel claim. And that's why I've mentioned Taylor Fashion's uh, a Liverpool Victoria trustees. That's a case of two, well, I know a lot of people know the case, but two uh, tenants of shops who were under the impression that they had a right uh, to renew uh, when they didn't. Uh, and one succeeded and one failed based upon what they would have would have would have done would or would not have done without the promise having been made. It looks as though uh, when it comes to promise-based proprietary estoppel, it's not quite as uh, dramatic as that. It's not uh, quite uh, such a heavy burden uh, upon the promise C. Uh, and again, quoted there, sufficient causal link between the insurance relied, assurance relied upon and the detriment asserted. And then uh, Mr. Justice Blackburn, who I've mis misspelt his name there, uh, in Century and Clibbery, uh, uh, says that it ha doesn't have to be the sole inducement. So it doesn't, it, it, as long as you can prove that's an inducement, uh, you succeed. Although the claimant in that case uh, didn't. Um, and then really coming back to a point that I've touched on, you're looking at it from the point of view of the promise seen, not the promise saw, when it comes to, the rel to reliance. Uh, and that is the quote from Lord Hoffman in Thorner there. Um, upon the subject of detriment, I think the most important point to bear in mind with detriment is it doesn't happen the instant the promise is made. It's something that builds over time and it can go up and it can go down because you could have what they call countervailing benefits along the way. If, you're, if you've got a promise of a farm when you die, but you're living in it rent-free already at the time, there is a balance. You've got, uh, you've got good things happening to you, but there's also potential detriment if you're having low wages or whatever else might be going on or of not of sacrificing your uh, other career uh, that you might have. But it's a detriment which um, builds over time. And then coming back to... Uh, Lord Justice Lewis and in Davies, the issue of detriment must be judged at the moment when the person who gave the insurance assurance seeks to go back on it. So in the case of Gillett and Holt, that was when uh, Mr. Holt took uh, Mr. Gillett out of his will. In the case of, uh, say, Anagra, it's which is where the, where the promise was dead by the time the proceedings were brought, it's when the estate uh, seeks to resile uh, from the promise that was made. And then one weighs the history, going all the way back to the promise to see whether there is a detriment. Um, and then the final component, unconscionability, important to bear in mind, unconscion unconscionability on its own will not do. So you can have unconscionable, but even be unconscionable conduct on the part of the promise or himself. That will not be uh, enough to uh, give rise to liability in proprietary estoppel. Um, I've quoted Cobb and Yeoman's Row in that case, again, very, very briefly. In that case, the claimant was making a, spending a lot of money acquiring planning permissions and working on a property on the basis that he would receive a substantial interest in it directly or indirectly from the owner of it. And the owner effectively did the dirty on him. In that case, the claimant lost because although the conduct was found to be unconscionable on the part of the defendant, uh, it, the, he had entered into, he was a sophisticated businessman, he'd entered into a, what was clearly stated to be subject to contract agreements and it was, it was held that he could not show reliance and so it's a case which uh, is usually quoted to show that unconscionability on its own uh, will not survive, sorry, will not suffice. Um, I've repeated there really what I've said already that the promisor need not have behaved unconscionably uh, and the promisor may have died believing, believing the promise had been fulfilled. Uh, Whaling and Jones is, a, is another good example of that. Uh, two gentlemen, uh, the younger one did a lot of work for very little uh, on businesses that the uh, deceased had, which cafes and restaurants uh, and so on, against promises uh, of inheriting them and then uh, the he died before he'd managed to put his affairs in order and uh, again 
found in favour of the claimant in that case in establishing a proprietary estoppel. Um, and then uh, the question the court will ask itself is, is the position of the party such that the court is now justified in intervening? And so that is this balancing exercise of all those various components uh, of, of the assurance made, the reliance, the detriment, and any unconscionability in the result. It's an unconscionability in the result. And then weigh that against the countervailing uh, benefits. And then if, if those things, it is sufficient of an imbalance, it will make an award to set it to satisfy the equity. Again, important to bear in mind, this is, this is, this is equity, it is stoppel, it's not a trust. And so section two, for example, law of property, um, miscellaneous provisions that which generally requires any land to be uh, in writing and, and certain formalities and so on, it does, is not an impediment to a proprietary estoppel uh, award, even if it involves land. Um, and when it comes to awards, extremely wide discretion in the court, uh, wider certainly than, than constructive trust even. Uh, high watermark for it is generally what the claimant's expectation uh, was at any given time based on the uh, assurances that they had. That too can fluctuate. Uh, so you could have a case, um, maybe I'd say Haberfield and Haberfield recently, another farming case where the daughter on the farm, she was in and out of the farm. Sometimes she was working on it, sometimes she'd fallen out and gone off and done something else. So her expectations were going up and down and up and down uh, during the course of, of her of her life and then I think her father died and I think her mother was still alive at the time of the uh, of the court action and then the court valued uh, the, the detriment against the benefits that she'd had which involved some rent free periods and then the expectation that uh, as it stood um, at the time that she was making her claim uh, as, uh, was was then um, given that as the starting point and then deductions made uh, from uh, from that point. Uh, in that case in particular, she'd turned down a partnership in the farm uh, a few years earlier, which again would lower the expectation uh, that she should have. But I thought that's just an example of the kind of flexibility that the court has. Um, I, I'm already 10 past six. So now this is copyright Walker. I didn't put in, oh, are you ready for the Latin, but I'll, we'll get it out quickly. In absolute outline, uh, I know it doesn't come up all that often, but Donatia, Donatio Mortis Causa uh, is still, it's still good law. It's not particular, judges don't seem to be particularly fond of it, but they, they do keep it very, very narrow. Um, so all these requirements must be, must be met. Uh, I think again, for people who are unfamiliar with it, it's, it's people who are just about to die. I think they're just about to die. And um, I think the theory behind it is they haven't got time to put together a will. And so they make, uh, so they make a gift, perhaps a bit akin to, will formality is not applying to the military, something like that. Um, the gift must be in contemplation of impending death. So it doesn't have to be imminent death, but he has the, the donor has to believe that his death's near and he has to know the reason where, why it is that he thinks he's, he's dying. Um, it also must be conditional. And this, is, this, this knocks out a lot of Donatio Morse's uh, cow's claims um, because so it has to be that if he doesn't die, if it proves to be a false alarm, that that is revoked. And so, for example, if you have a case such as King and Dubry, maybe, which is relatively recent, in which the, um, the in which the, the donor, in fact, had made had made a will, but it wasn't properly uh, executed, that was fatal to the claim in Donatio Mortis Causa because it showed that he wasn't intending it to be revocable in the event of his uh, of him of him not uh, dying in in the near future and then finally the subject matter must have been delivered in the case of land keys will do so keys to the property will do and indeed uh, even keys to the box that contains the title deeds have been found sufficient but there has to be uh, there has to be delivery uh, in some in some form. So I say it doesn't come up all that often. Though I did have one last year uh, uh, on Donatio Mortis Causa, and I thought I would add it in because uh, it's relevant and uh, you can still uh, run uh, DMC. Uh, it's it's like that. That's the way it is. I shall end there.